Okay, thank you. So today I was going to... Uh, address the, uh, the issue of expanders and shrinkers in the, um, in the case of uh, SOP cross SOQ symmetry. So we'll look at uh, hypersurfaces M of the form of this type, evolving by mean curvature flow. Um, so, And um, so for simplicity today, so yesterday I discussed all the minimal surfaces that exist in this uh, situation. And today I want to uh, show um, which expanders and shrinkers you can construct and the, the, uh, the, how many there are is dimension dependent. Um, and the most interesting case is where the dimension, the total dimension P plus Q um, is between seven and four. And P and Q will always be greater than or equal to two. Um, and so, the picture for all these cases is very similar. So uh, to simplify all the calculations, uh, the equations that we're going to get, I'm just going to assume uh, for today that P and Q are both equal to two. And uh, so that leads to the, um, the following OD, uh, PDEs. Uh, so B curvature flow for MT is equivalent with um, always this first term. And then here you get P minus one. So that's just one over X times UX minus Q minus one. That's one over U. So this is, this is going to be, uh, today is about that one particular PD. Um, and the, uh, so the boundary conditions are, are this. And I'm going to look for self-similar solutions. So if we look for um, hypersurfaces that evolve according to that are, uh, so uh, hypersurfaces that evolve according to this rule. I, I always think of this as separation of variables. It's, uh, the situation is very analogous to what you do with uh, ordinary uh, differential equations. You, uh, or with uh, you, well, undergraduate PDEs, if you have a linear PDE, you, uh, the simplest solutions that you find uh, you get by separating variables, you substitute a function of t that multiplied with a function of x. So here we have a function of t multiplied, and then instead of a function of x, we have uh, the hypersurface, which is the space-dependent thing. Um, so, okay, so if you look for self-similar solutions of this type, uh, so for plus you get expanders, for T, you get, uh, for negative minus, you get uh, shrinkers. Uh, these correspond to um, solutions of the form UXT is this again. And so this kind of function uh, is characterized by the condition that uh, UT is equal to one half U minus X times UX with a plus or minus. Um, and this plus or minus one half, I'll abbreviate to, uh, so I'll call that lambda. So, um, and so if the time derivative has to be equal to this, then I'll just replace that time derivative here. So the, the ODE for uh, expander shrinkers is I 
Okay, and if I sort the terms like this, then I have this, the terms that have, uh, these terms all have units one over length, these terms all have unit length, so they scale differently. Um, and so we're going to, um, how do we analyze the solutions to this equation? Um, to begin, uh, first, uh, given a particular height A here, uh, there, should be, there should be exactly one solution coming out of here. Uh, what we did last time for the minimal surface equation where lambda is zero, so you could, you could include that here. Uh, we uh, considered scaling invariant quantities because this term was not there, so it made sense to look at scaling invariant quantities, bless you. So, um, let's see, z is x over u, so that's, that's this slope. And w is ux, that's this quantity. And uh, so in the scale, those are the two scaling invariant quantities that you can associate to a curve, and they, if you know these, you can reconstruct. So if you know these, quant these functions along the curve, you can reconstruct the curve up to a scaling. Um, that's not going to work for this differential equation anymore when lambda is not zero because uh, this equation is not scaling invariant. So what we do is we look uh, at a three system of three differential equations. I just add the third variable is x, which is itself. And uh, so now uh, prime is x d d x. And if you want to, you can say, uh, if we do an exponential change of variables of, uh, of the independent variable, sorry, yeah, the independent variable along the, uh, along the curve. Uh, and if you do this, then the differential equations you get are the same system that we had yesterday plus uh, a few extra terms. So we had, um, so, z prime is, so dz, which is dz d theta, uh, that's always this. W prime now is it's basically just these terms. So we get. Um, Right, so you get these terms, the, um, right, this x squared, so this term was not here yesterday. Um, and then x prime, what is x prime? x prime is just x. Okay, so we now have a three-dimensional system of differential equations. If we have solutions to these differential equations, then we can reconstruct, uh, so first of all, we know everything is a function of x because x is one of the solutions. Um, and just from these relations, we can then reconstruct u. All right, u is, u is just x divided by z. So if, you, uh, if we have solutions to these, we can reconstruct the surface. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the boundary conditions that we have are boundary conditions at x is zero are the following. Um, so first of all, x is zero. Um, z is x over u, so x is zero, u is equal to a. Right, so we're looking at, so I'm trying to construct a solution that starts at height a and does something like this. Um, 
Okay, so x is zero, u is a, so this will also be zero, and w is ux. We always want this angle to be 90 degrees, because then when you swing it around the axis, you get a smooth surface. So this also has to be equal to zero. Um, okay, so the number a does not appear in this condition, so that it will show up a little later. So the, the solutions that we're trying to construct uh, start at this point, and for this three-dimensional system, they have, these are solutions starting at the origin. So we have to see what solutions start at the origin. So we do the same thing as yesterday. We linearize. We have uh, one extra equation, so we'll get a three-by-three three system. And I, I long ago decided uh, never to computer determinant or find eigenvalues in public. But this one is, is easy, so uh, so the system is, I think it's better if I write WZ. So I'm going to throw away all higher order terms. So for W, the, um, the only linear term that we get Ah, sorry, yeah. Um, near the origin, this term is uh, singular, right? So I can't, I can't start at zero. Um, that would be a problem. Uh, what I do is um, I'm going to reparameterize the equation and I should in introduce a new variable, uh, another theta. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply all these equations with z. I'm sorry, this is not what happened before. Sorry, yeah. Um, to deal with this singularity, we have to introduce a new variable. You look at one over z as the new variable minus that, doesn't solve this, oh, this is Yes.
Yeah, so the, the proper way to do this is not to use uh, Z and W, but to use these angles, and then, uh, then all these, uh, these things don't show up, but then the equations become a bit, and I don't know if I want to spend time on, so this. So I was trying to present you a simplified version of what we actually did with this, so the simplification is too much. Yeah, sorry about this. Um, Okay, so if you'll bear with me for a second, I'll just have to... Um Sorry? Yes, but I, so, okay, so what I was, what I want to do is, so if this is a, uh, a regular system of differential equations, if the right-hand sides are smooth in, in all the, you know, if they're polynomials, then you can linearize and there's an unstable manifold. And if you use, uh, uh, so that thing exists if you use instead of, so if you take the angles, if you take the angles instead of the tangents of the angles, so we would have to do a certain amount of algebra to, So if I, uh, right, so at x is zero, this term should not be relevant. So if I, let's see what happens. So you could add a fourth equation, u prime equals, let's do this, u prime equals x times, so u prime is x times ux, which is x times w. So if I write the equations like this, I'll, so, Okay, so I've replaced this term by this, and the cost is that we have to add an extra variable. X squared Z. Okay, I'm really sorry about this. X squared over Z, right, U is X over Z. So X squared over Z is X times U. So 
this should be just a U. Yeah. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm going to cut this calculation short a bit. Um, there is, yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm going to not do this because I'm not really sure how this is going to continue. I, I should have started with uh, this being, uh, with this angle calling that theta and this one phi and then work with those and then if you take the radius as a uh, variable, you get a nice system of differential equations, but it, the formulas are longer and I, uh, while preparing for this, I, it looked like this was shorter, but I must have overlooked that one over Z. Um, okay, so uh, let me put it differently. So the, the result is, uh, is this, so lemma. So for any positive A, there is a unique solution of that type, so to um, the equation. So let me call this the expander shrinker equation. And now, um, I'm still going to use that system that I have over there because once, okay, so and now we have to distinguish, so lambda, and this actually, this is true for any value of lambda, so, but uh, in particular lambda, so. Lambda is allowed to be plus or minus one half. So uh, for both expanders and shrinkers, we get a solution. Um, okay, so let me do expanders first. So in this case, the same kind of arguments that I showed you yesterday show you that um, this is defined for all positive values of A. Um, and again, it's the, uh, so it's the same kind of arguments. Uh, the second derivative at the origin has to be positive. Uh, at any point where the first derivative is zero, the second derivative has to be positive, so that means there can't, there can only be one of them. Um, okay, so that you get that from this equation and the fact that lambda is positive. Um, So they're defined for all positive, for all, sorry, for all x positive, right? So these, these solutions are globally defined and this is, for, and, and for all a, so um, we get a whole family of uh, expanders. And now the, what happens to these things as x goes to infinity? So 
So as x goes to infinity, let's look at these equations. Um, the one term, so there's one place, so x shows up here. As x goes to infinity, this becomes the most important part of the equation. And so, so for uh, very large values of x, I'll calculate uh, this. Okay, so this is minus z prime over z squared minus uh, w prime, and this is, um, now as x goes to infinity, this becomes minus 1 over z plus w plus, and then all those terms, 1 plus w squared z minus w plus lambda x squared. Okay, and now if you assume, which you can prove, so you would have to, uh, if you assume that z and one over z are uh, bounded so that the, the slopes don't get close to zero or infinity and that the, uh, the slope of the tangent also doesn't get close to zero or infinity, then for large values of x, all these, the only uh, important term is this one. You get, you get this equation. Uh, the difference 1 over z minus w uh, satisfies an almost linear equation. So there is, this is, consider this the inhomogeneous term. This is the, the factor multiplying 1 over z minus w. Um, as x goes to infinity, uh, if lambda is Careful now, here I have minus w prime, so all these things should have had minuses. So, not this one. This one needs a minus. Okay, so what happens for large values of x? This becomes a really large number. This is of order one. Uh, this tells you that uh, this quantity will decay exponentially at some rate that you can figure out. So, um, and what is one over z minus w? Well, one over z is u over x, and w was ux. So, this tells us that uh, if you're far away, um, So the interpretation is this. Uh, let's say you're on the solution of uh, one of the solutions of the differential equation. You're at this point. Uh, 1 over z minus w is the difference between, the, uh, it's, it's essentially these angles, except these are the tangents of angles. So uh, it's the tangent of this angle minus the tangent of that angle. Okay. And what this says is that those two are going to zero. The difference between those two are going to zero. So as you're moving along, along this curve, the, uh, the slope of the tangent will, um, will rotate and it's going to align with the slope of uh, this, this line. Okay, so um, solutions will look like this. Right? 
right? So if a solution is moving, you're on a solution and you arrived here, you're moving in this direction, the, uh, the direction in which you're moving is going to align with the radius vector, and so it'll just do this. Right, so, and this, so if you take this, it implies that the solution goes to a cone. In particular, if you, um, if you use the fact that this is of order one and that this is x squared, uh, you can improve this using barriers to show that this is something of order one over x squared. Uh, so then, um, since that is integrable, you can prove that the, uh, the thing converges to a cone. Right, and the order one over x squared is this order one divided by this x squared. And so in this argument, I'll, what, so I'm going to repeat this argument for uh, shrinkers. So, uh, so instead of repeating it, let me just say what changes right now. So in a second, we'll look at shrinkers. If so, for shrinkers, lambda would be minus one half. And everything is the same, except this lambda now is negative. And instead of, um, so this differential equation for the difference between those two angles uh, forces that difference to grow exponentially rather than shrink. Right? So for, for shrinkers, you would have the following picture. So if you're on uh, a shrinker and you're, the slope to the curve is uh, not aligned with the radius vector, then that differential equation forces this slope to turn around. So if you're moving around, it will, uh, the solution will look like this, which if you plot solutions of this, or if you try to you know, compute solutions uh, numerically, and you have something that is sort of on a cone, uh, this cone is unstable. If your tangent at some point is uh, deviates slightly from the cone, then it will turn around and it will do something like this. So shrinkers look like this. Uh, or they could go the other way around, depending on what the instability looked like. Okay, so uh, this explains why uh, there are lots of expanders, but there are very few shrinkers. Um, and so there's a, so there's a, P, let me at this point mention a PDE version of this. Uh, So this is not an ODE statement, this is, a, this is a PDE statement, and so if M1 and M2 in um, Rn If you have two smooth cell shrinkers for mean curvature flow, mean curvature flow uh, that are that are asymptotic to the same cone at infinity. So uh, these are so they're self-shrinking solutions. They're asymptotic to a cone. Both of them are asymptotic to the same cone. Then they must be the same. Okay, so what we're seeing in the ODE here is a, uh, is a manifestation of this fact. Uh, 
Okay, so we have, uh, so back to expanders. Uh, for, each, for each A, so back to expanders. For each A, we have a, an expander. It's a monotonically increasing function. It is asymptotic to some cone. Uh, there will be some asymptotic expansion that I uh, wrote down the other day. Um, the question is, so, which, uh, which cones can we achieve by, uh, by an expander? So how does the slope of the asymptotic cone depend on A? And uh, so, <clears throat> okay, so with, uh, look, by looking at these ODEs again uh, and doing more analysis, you can prove that they depend continuously on the shooting height A. Um, what I want to explain is, um, And this is, so what, is the, what are the asymptotics for this as A goes to zero? Um, so what do the shrinkers look like when A is a small number? So you get, um, the ODE is gone, so I'll work with this ODE. So where lambda is plus one half, uh, but the same arguments also work for other lambdas. Um, and so uh, I'm going to, so we're, uh, y is x is the stationary cone, that's a special solution. We're looking at solutions that start down here, which is a singular, so u is zero is a singular point, x is zero, u is zero is a, you know, two terms become singular at that point. So to analyze what happens here, we have to rescale. Um, so I zoom in on this neighborhood and I multiply it with a factor a. A one over a. Okay, and so what do we get? If I do that with this equation, <clears throat> so let me say, uh, let me give this variable. What happens to this equation? The, um, let's see. So ux, all the uxs are scaling invariant. uxx gets, becomes, uh, gets divided by a. One over u gets divided by a. Uh, these things all get multiplied by a. So if you do, if you allow me to do it like this. Okay, and this is similar, again, to what I did yesterday. So you get this equation where A is a small number. Um, and now the initial conditions are uh, V of zero is one. And Vx, or v, this becomes Vy of zero is zero. And so as you let A go to zero, the right-hand uh, side goes to zero, and what we get is the differential equation for minimal surfaces. So in the limit, what we'll see down here
In the limit, what you see is the minimal surface equation. And, um, okay, so where this is exactly at height one, we know there's exactly one such solution. We analyzed it yesterday. It is, um, it oscillates, it intersects the cone infinitely often and is asymptotic to the cone. Um, And then yesterday from the asymptotic, so, uh, so what is the shape of this diff difference? So, to, so this, this is one building block of the solution. So this thing is going to show up here. And um, so that thing describes the solution here on a length scale of A, large multiple of A. To get the rest of the solution, we will have to analyze the equation in this region. But what we see is that the, uh, so what does the solution look like here near the origin? After it has, it has done this, uh, come off the uh, vertical axis, it converges to the, uh, to the cone and it stays cone, it stays close to the cone and parallel to the cone. So now we have to, we have to analyze what solutions in this region look like and the boundary conditions we have is that they are close to the cone here and parallel to the cone. Okay, so um, let me not do this. And the calculation that I'm showing you is, uh, it's a typical uh, applied math calculation. It's a, a formal matched asymptotic expansion uh, for the solution. And so uh, the, the formal matched asymptotic expansion, expansion by its, in itself doesn't give proofs, but the, uh, these are ODEs and the, uh, uh, so the, the calculations can be justified afterwards. Okay, so I, I want to show you the results. Okay, so we assume that the V of X is uh, much smaller than X. We substitute this. Uh, so now here we go back to the original equation again. And the only difference with uh, what we had before is that we've given up the boundary conditions. So the boundary conditions uh, are no, we're not looking at these boundary conditions, but we're assuming that the solution is going to match with whatever comes out of this small corner here. Okay, so. Okay, so if you said u is equal to x plus a small function phi of x, you end up linearizing this equation. Um, and so let me tell you the result of the linearization. Actually most terms, so this term and those terms are all linear, so those will just stay like this. This, if you linearize around x, becomes plus one over x squared times phi. And here, u of x is roughly one, so.
Okay, so the linearized equation that we get is this, and then of course, because you're linearizing, there are uh, terms of order phi squared and phi x squared, and so part of the formal part of the calculation, uh, this being a formal calculation, means that we're going to ignore those uh, quadratic terms for now. Uh, so this is the linear equation. So the solution to this linear equation, is, uh, this is a linear uh, differential equation. It's a, one of the standard equations. These are, uh, you will find them in all textbooks. Um, it has two, there are two solutions, or uh, there's a two-dimensional space of solutions. Um, if you look at um, so it's not constant coefficient, but if you look at the coefficients near x is zero, it's a regular singular point. And so this means that the, uh, you, can, uh, you can find power series expansions. So uh, phi one and two x, both are of the form x to the power r times a polynomial in x, um, times a power series in x. Um, and the coefficients r that you find are, by substituting here, are, uh, so the characteristic equation is this. And you can find the roots, and let me not calculate them, but the roots that you get are R1 uh, and 2, are, they are complex. Um, so this is, the, this is the one place where, uh, in this story, that is dimension dependent. So depending on P and Q, will you, you will get different roots. If, P, if the dimension P plus Q is less than 8, um, you, get, uh, you get complex roots. So here you get minus alpha plus or minus I beta. So alpha is a positive number. So these are the complex roots. And okay, so both solutions, so near zero, phi of x is x to the power minus alpha plus or minus i beta. And so you would have to take, these are complex valued solutions, so you get, uh, you take the real part, so you get, um, You get something like this. Uh, you get x to the minus alpha. That's uh, from this factor. The this constant, the complex constant. You take the absolute value out. What is, remains is uh, a phase theta, and then you get the real part of x to the i beta, which is which is this expression. Okay. So near zero. What what do these solutions look like near zero? They oscillate. Which is good because they have to massilate, they have to match uh, with the oscillating uh, minimal surface. So near zero, my what phi looks like is some, something that oscillates like this. And as x goes to zero, log x goes to minus infinity. So this thing oscillates infinitely often as you go into zero. On the other hand, um, this x to the minus alpha as x goes to zero becomes unbounded, right? So these, these solutions, they oscillate infinitely often. Uh, 
but the oscillations also grow. They become really large, which means that this fee, uh, the, this approximation that we made that uh, u is equal to x plus phi can't be valid for all, val uh, all values of x. Uh, as soon as this function phi becomes a little bit large, uh, we have to switch to the other, the minimal surface uh, expansion. Okay, so um, so match with the inner expansion. How do you do that? Um, so what was the inner expansion? That is u of x is a times v of x over a. And v is this, um, I keep pointing at this picture because it's almost the same picture. So the minimal surface looked like this. We have to rescale this thing down, and that will give us a, a fun that's the function v that we have here, and we have to match that with uh, match that with this expression. So this leads to a certain amount of algebra, and let me tell you the result. So first of all, um, as you let a go to zero in this expression, this goes to infinity. Right. So to uh, to match this for small a with uh, with these functions, we need to know the behavior of v for large values of a. And so v of y is, well, for large values of y, um, the thing is asymptotic to the cone. It is y plus, and now you need to know the, uh, the deviation of v from the cone. And you can do a calculation similar to this one, and what you'll find uh, is the same linearization, except here you're dealing with minimal surfaces, so that means that this term uh, is gone. Lambda will be zero. So the linearization is the same. So uh, what we find is that V of Y has an, ex has an asymptotic expansion, and it is, uh, so for Y going to infinity, it is Y plus, and then the next term is something like this. particularly the exponent alpha and beta is the same because they come from the same differential equation. And then there are extra terms which are small compared to this. Okay, so now here I have to replace y by x over a. Um, so we get two. Okay, so we have uh, the inner expansion is u of x is a times v of y uh, of x over a. Uh, you get um, that y becomes an x. Everything gets multiplied with a, so we get c0 times a to the power this y minus alpha becomes so here we get a multiplied with a to the alpha 1 plus alpha x to the minus alpha and then we get this cosine cosine um, beta log, and then here I have to write x over a, and then using the property of the cosine, that's beta minus beta log a plus theta naught. Okay, so a large formula. Um,
and the outer expansion okay so there's one more ingredient that I have to tell you I said uh, so for the outer expansion I'm going to use this expression and we will compare with this one uh, but now here I wrote this is true for every phi for every solution to the uh, to this linearized equation um, but there are two of them so what angles do we get here um, and so how I'm going to select those two solutions. So before I do that, I have to, uh, so, the, so the, the way we select the solutions here is by looking at their behavior at infinity. So I'll come back to this here. I'm going to write u. And so the, we're going to look at the behavior as x goes to infinity of this, this equation. So it's a classical equation, so you could just, you could look it up. Uh, even Wikipedia will tell you, or you know, the internet will tell you what this thing does. Uh, a quick way to remember what happens is that there are, um, as x goes to infinity, you could assume that either the first, the function phi and phi x, uh, that, uh, that they are the dominant term. So then this would have to be zero. So if this is zero and this is negligible, then uh, this, the solution to this is that phi is approximately a linear function. The other option is that the second derivative is actually the largest, and then the largest terms are this phi x x and x times phi x. And this tells you, so you integrate this, uh, this tells you that phi x is roughly like e to the minus lambda x squared. And this, uh, so the sign, so again, lambda can be plus or negative, positive or minus, uh, sorry, positive or negative here. Um, you get two very different behaviors here if you change the sign of lambda. So for expanders, lambda is positive, and this means that uh, there is a solution that decays to zero really fast. Um, if, lamb if you're looking at, at shrinkers, then what you get is uh, this la minus lambda becomes positive, and this means that uh, most solutions blow up really fast, and this is the same phenomenon as what I showed uh, Drew before. Uh, if you follow solutions of the shrinker equation, you go out along a cone, the cone is unstable and the solutions will tend to turn around either going up or down. Okay, so it's, it's the same phenomenon. Okay, so at this point we don't need this equation anymore. So let me stick to the case where lambda is uh, positive. So for uh, expanders in that case, so what this shows is that there, uh, most solutions will grow linearly at infinity and there's one special solution that uh, decays exponentially. So I'll let, So I'll let phi1 be the solution that uh, has this uh, behavior at infinity, or a solution that has this behavior at infinity. It is x plus little o of x, and I'll let phi2 be uh, the solution that is e to the minus lambda x squared plus little o of x squared. Okay, so this choice uh, determines, uh, this choice uniquely determines phi2. This one determines phi1 up to adding multiples of phi2 because if you add a multiple of this to that, you still get something that is x plus little o of x, okay? So you just pick one of these. Okay, so now we have <clears throat> So 
So this thing is um, like x at infinity, and this one is um, like, uh, actually, yeah, so phi 2 of x is like, And this one is like, has this expansion, um, this one. Okay, so this phi2 is uniquely determined by this asymptotic expansion, so that means that the coefficients that I have here, this c, uh, these are uniquely determined by that choice. These are specific numbers. So this phase angle theta 2 and this number C2 are, um, are completely determined by that choice. And now I can, um, this other one uh, will have, so this phi1 where we have a lot of freedom, uh, we can choose the uh, asymptotic expansion here at infinity. It'll be C2 times x to the minus alpha uh, cosine beta log, sorry, it'll be cosine beta log x minus some other phase angle, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose that phase angle so that it, it's, uh, that this becomes a sine. Okay, so I'll do that. Um, so then the general solution is, um, This will be x plus c1 times phi1x plus c2 times phi2x. And what I want to do is I want to find c1 and c2 by writing this out and comparing what I have with what I have up here. And let me do that. So near x is zero, what you get is x plus, and here you get um, c1. So both these phi1 and phi2 contain, um, contain this same constant, c2. Uh, and the only difference is that one of them has a cosine and the other has a sine. x to the minus alpha, and one of them has cosine, uh, sorry. Okay, so that's the expansion we have near zero. So now we have to compare this with that, and unfortunately that, that tells you, um, right, this is a cosine, and you have to compare it with this thing. Uh, you use the addition formula, so. You get, so. I'm going to write this as beta log x minus theta 2 plus beta log a plus theta naught minus theta 2. And I'll apply the addition formula for cosine to these two things. And what I get is one thing, one term with a sine and one term with a cosine. And so you can imagine that that's going to be a long formula. Instead of writing all that out, uh, let's see which term we want. Uh, once we know the expansion of u 
uh, to be this. Um, then we can look at, uh, so what, what do, we, do we have? We have the solution, the expander that starts at height A, small value of A near the origin. Uh, we can follow it along the minimal surface that has been rescaled. Then, it then uh, near the cone, it, follows, it stays near the stationary cone for a while, uh, behaving like this. And then we want to know its asymptotic behavior as x goes to infinity. So we have to look at what happens to this expression as x goes to infinity. And that's, um, okay, so as x goes to infinity, the term with phi2 just goes to zero really fast. Okay, so this term we can forget about. Uh, this one grows linearly, so that indicates that the solution is going to deviate from a cone. And the coefficient multiplying phi1, this c1 here, tells us how much it will deviate from a cone. So what I want to get out of this calculation is C1. Okay, so that means I have to get the term multiplying, uh, I have to get the term with sine of beta log x. So of the addition formula, uh, so cosine alpha plus beta is cosine alpha beta, it's minus sine, so we get minus sine of this Okay, so the addition formula gives you this, and the, uh, the thing to look at is, what is C1? So this, this C1, x to the minus alpha, matches this and almost that. Um, so the conclusion is, The coefficient multiplying phi1 is um, c0 a to the 1 plus alpha divided by c1, absolute value. Um, and then this sign, so we get a minus sign. And again, this is a formal uh, calculation, so the actual value is a small perturbation of this, and a part of making this rigorous is to show that the perturbation is much smaller than this. Uh, but, but all that can be done. Okay, so this implies, so uh, this, let's, these are just other constants. So this is, my, this is a constant times a to the power one plus alpha times sine beta log a plus some other phase angle. Okay, so it has this form. And the conclusion of this is, uh, so now we can erase phi2. So the shape of the expander with u0 is equal to a is the following. On the scale a here, it's a minimal surface, so that's the thing that we started with. Then, so it intersects the minimal surface many times. Then, for a large uh, length, it follows the cone, and at some point it is So when you're far away, um, it is x plus c1 times x. And c1 is given by that formula. Okay, so in particular, the asymptotic slope of this cone is one plus C one of A. Ah. So I'm a little over time, but let me just write down the, um, so 
let me graph this. This is A. Okay, what is the graph of this function? The graph of this plus A. Well, it goes to zero, as A goes to zero, it goes to zero like A to the one plus alpha. And as A goes to infinity, this log goes to zero, this log A goes to minus infinity, so this, so this sign will oscillate up and down very often. And what you get is, uh, you get uh, a curve, so the slope as a function of A oscillates up and down infinitely often, um, and so one conclusion, so one conclusion is, so what was the question, which cones can we, for which cones can we find expanders and how many expanders can you find? So if you pick a certain value of A here, then these are all the expanders that you find. Right, so the conclusion is that the closer the cone is to the stationary cone, the more expanders there are. So in particular, the stationary cone itself has an infinite sequence of expanders, self smooth self-similar expanders coming out of the cone. Um, okay, and then the, uh, so this is the story for expanders. Now, what about shrinkers? And so it's the same story, so it could in principle take as long, but instead let me tell you what happens, uh, so very quickly. Uh, for shrinkers, you do the exact same thing, except at this point here, what are C1 and C2? You determine C1 and C2 in the exact same uh, way. It's when you look at the behavior at infinity, uh, you, uh, you have to do different things with the C2. So as, as x goes to infinity for shrinkers, remember this phi 2 of x doesn't decay like e to the minus x squared, it blows up like e to the plus x squared. So the only, the only solutions of this type that correspond, that will actually give you sh shrinkers that are asymptotic to cones are the ones where C2 is zero. So to get shrinkers, you have to do this calculation, but you have to find C2. Uh, as well, right, which is this, which will be this other term here. And that thing has to be zero, because otherwise you will get a solution that blows up a uh, differential equation that is not asymptotic to a cone. So for shrinkers, what you find is that you don't get a shrinker for each value of A, but there's an infinite sequence of A's, because uh, this, this thing has the same argument, it's beta log A plus that phase. So as A goes to zero, there will be an infinite number of times where this hits a multiple of pi. Uh, plus pi over two, and the making this cosine zero. So you get an infinite sequence of shrinkers. And the asymptotic slope of those shrinkers are given by this constant, which is the exact same formula that we have here. Okay, so for shrinkers, what we find is that there are uh, not, there's not a whole family of them, uh, but there's, uh, there's an infinite sequence of slopes. Well, there's a sequence of A's going to zero. Uh, and for each uh, A in that sequence, there is a shrinker with that asymptotic slope. And the asymptotic slope converges to one. So for large enough N, you get a smooth, you get a smooth shrinker whose slope will be somewhere over here. So let's say it would be this one. And then for that slope, there are many, many smooth expanders. So that's how you get the non-uniqueness. Okay, so I'm sorry about the mess in the beginning. I uh, would have preferred to spend more time on this. Um, but I'll, I'll, if you have questions, I'll be happy to explain uh, in further detail.